Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Cheryl Reynolds, and I'm with the UC Statewide IPM program. And today's UC Ag Expert talk is on respirators. Peter Casina from UC IPM is also here with me and helping with the polls and our technical issues. And um, now I'd like to uh, introduce our speaker for today. We have Lisa Blecker. She's the Pesticide Safety Education Program Coordinator for the UC IPM program. And today she's going to be speaking on respirators. And so now I'd like to pass this over to Lisa. So go ahead, Lisa, and you can share your screen. Okay, well, thank you everybody for being here. Timekeeping. Um, so as Cheryl mentioned, I'm the Pesticide Safety Education Program Coordinator. Um, I coordinate different uh, pesticide safety programs across the state. I'm located up here in Davis, but I do travel statewide, or sometimes I just sit in my office and uh, project statewide. So that's kind of nice. Um, there's some contact information for me here on the screen, and I'll flash it up again at the end. So just to give an overview of what I plan to talk about today um, with regard to pesticide, uh, to respirators and pesticide uses. Um, you know, the, there's a big wide world of respirators out there. And so I want to make sure that we can cover everything in an hour and we're not going to get to a complete program, but I'm going to give you some basics and some real good meaty information. So we'll talk about what is a respirator, how to get a proper seal when you're wearing a respirator, um, when you need to wear a respirator, respirator requirements specifically here in the state of California when you're making pesticide applications, how to choose the correct respirator for your use, and then when to dispose of filters and cartridges. So this is not a comprehensive respiratory protection training. We have just an hour and respirators are pretty comprehensive. So this won't satisfy your annual training requirement if you um, must be trained on annually on respirators. Um, and I'm not gonna teach you how to perform a fit test, but I'm gonna teach you a lot of other really good things. So uh, we're gonna start with a poll. And so for those of you particularly on cell phones, once we flash the poll up, you're not gonna see these pictures. So take a look at these pictures, kind of burn them into your memory um, before we uh, flash the actual question of the poll up. So there, your answers will be A, B, or C, depending on what you think. So which of these photos represents something that is a respirator? So you can choose one, two, or three responses. So which of these pictures is a re represents a respirator. All right, we're closing this one out and bringing up the results. Okay, so um, somehow 103% of the people said that A was a respirator. I don't understand statistics well enough to understand that, but okay, most people thought that A was a respirator. Um, many people thought that B was a respirator, and some of you thought that C was a respirator. So, um, uh, are, so think about it in your head. What is it about these pictures that made you think that these were respirators? Because we'll talk about that. Okay, so, oh. So here are those pictures once again. Are you guys ready for the results? I'm just building suspense here. So the first picture is a respirator. I think you all know that as indicated by the poll results. The second picture is also a respirator. It's a little bit different than the first one. It's a filtering face piece. And the third one is also a respirator. So these are all respirators. And I'll tell you why they're all respirators. But first, I need you to answer another poll. So in the United States, all respirators must be certified by which agency? Is it the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH uh, for short? Is it the California Department of Pesticide Regulations, CDPR? Or is it the US Environmental Protection Agency, US EPA? 
Okay, we're going to close this one out and bring up the results. Okay, so it looks like most people indicated that NIOSH, which is the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, was the agency in the United States which tests and certifies uh, respirators. Um, and that's actually the correct answer, which looks like 93% of you guys already knew that. And so um, NIOSH is a national center. It's part of the Center for Disease Prevention and Control, Control and Prevention. And so they test and certify respirators, even pesticide respirators. So all respirators are going to have some indication on them that they have been certified by NIOSH. Okay, so this is a respirator and many, oops, sorry, and many of you knew that, right? A lot of people say, okay, so with the filtering face pieces, when they see them, they see, they say that the, it has two straps and that's an indication that's a respirator. And that's fine. Uh, respirators do have two straps rather than like a dust mask that just has one, but that's not the only indication. There's a couple of other things on here, okay? So this P95 is gonna be important. And up here, it also says NIOSH. And so many people think that this middle thing is the filter, okay? And it's not actually the filter. It is uh, an exhalation valve. So they're not always on a respirator. But this whole big thing, the thing that fits over your face, that is the filter, okay? So as I indicated, your respirators, if it's a filtering face piece, the respirator is gonna say NIOSH on it somewhere. That is the certifying agency. If your respirator doesn't say NIOSH, it's not a respirator, okay? It's going to indicate its resistance to oil degradation by giving you a letter. It will either say N, R, or P, okay? So N means not resistant to oil, R means somewhat resistance, resistant to oil, and P means mostly oil proof or resistant to oil. Okay, so there will be a letter code and then there will be a number which is going to indicate filter efficiency and it's either 95, 99 or 100 and there's not a huge difference between 95 and 100, whereas there is a big difference between the N, the R and the P. So that's really what you want to pay closest attention to. So just remember when you have a filtering face piece, this whole thing is the filter that is a respirator. I need technical support. Okay, so it'll say NIOSH on it, indicating that it's been tested and certified. It will say N, R, or P to give you an indication of what kind of particulates it, will, it is resistant to, and then it'll give you a number for filter efficiency. Okay, so this was the third picture, or very similar to the third picture, and it also is a respirator. This whole thing that fits over your face is the filter. And you can see here it says NIOSH and it says N95, so it's not resistant to oil. And also many of them have this TC code. So TC means tested and certified by NIOSH. And this one in this case is 84A. And I'll talk about, um, I'll talk about the codes in just a few minutes. So there are two primary types of respirators. There's an air supplying respirator and an air purifying type respirators. Okay, so air supplying respirators aren't ones that we're really gonna talk about today. They're used, um, they provide their own oxygen, right? It's clean air, they're not purifying any air. They're, you bring your own air and it's pressurized tanks and they're primarily used in emergency situations and in low oxygen environments. So I'm not gonna say any more about air supplying respirators because that's not primarily what you are going to be using, okay? So the other type of respirators are air purifying. Basically you with your body are breathing in external air that has contaminants in it and you are using these filters these physical and chemical filters attached to the respirator to filter out the air. And so these could be powered or non-powered. Okay, so this is a filtering face piece. It's sometimes called a dust mist mask. It is an air purifying respirator. 
And so often it's listed on pesticide labels or in technical documents as TC84A. But the most important thing to know is that it filters out dusts and mists, including spray droplets, okay? It's not going to filter out any kind of vapor or gas. It is simply a dust, mist, spray droplet type of uh, filter, okay? And so there are cartridge respirators. So you see here on the photo, that's a cartridge that's attached to um, a face piece that gets reused, okay? And a lot of times we call this an elastomeric respirator because it's made out of some sort of like stretchy fabric or it's not fabric, stretchy material, okay? So this will remove low levels of vapors, dusts and mists. So it's a TC23C is a cartridge respirator, but when it has a filter attached to it, and I'll talk about that, then it's a TC84A, just like the dust mists. So all cartridges are color coded according to the type of vapor or gas that it filters out. And then they, they have a particulate pre-filter and those are classified exactly the same way that a dust mist mask or a filtering face piece is is uh, classified. So N, R, or P also will tell you an, uh, 95, 99, or 100, okay? So this respirator that we're looking at right now, this is the cartridge, and there's a filter on top of the cartridge, and that filter filters out dust, mist, and spray droplets, and the cartridge filters out vapors. Okay, and so this is how a cartridge respirator is going to work. So over here on the right side of my screen, and I think yours as well, that's your face, right? That's the elastomeric face piece. And so contaminated air goes through, it's working its way through, okay? There are very various pieces and parts. So there's this particulate pre-filter right here. It traps airborne particles. That is the piece that is going to be rated N, R, or P, 95, 99, or 100. And then that is attached to the cartridge with like a plastic retainer, okay? And then it, after, um, after that, um, there's a chemical cartridge. And so a lot of times it has carbon and other things out there and it absorbs gases. And all of this is filtering out all kinds of different um, contaminants in the air so that by the time the air gets into your lungs, it is clean or uh, it's purified. I wouldn't say clean. So um, let's take poll number nine a little out of order. So um, burn these images into your brain, those of you who are on a cell phone, because you're not going to see the picture when we flash the poll question up. But the top picture has got a green band around the cartridge. The middle picture has a black band. And the bottom picture has a white band around the cartridge. So here's the poll. The color used to identify an organic vapor cartridge is either green, black, or white. What is the color on a cartridge to indicate that it is an organic vapor filtering cartridge? Is it green, black, or white? Okay, we're gonna close it out and bring up the results screen. I'm anxiously awaiting your results. So um, about 67% of the people thought that a green band around the cartridge um, indicated an organic vapor cartridge. Um, about 25% thought it was black and fewer of you thought it was white. So, okay, here we go. Are you guys ready to hear the answer? So organic vapors are uh, coded, color coded with a black band. So this right here is a 3M cartridge and you can see it has a black band, okay? This is a Moldex cartridge, so it's a different brand of respirator. 
it is also black. So regardless of the company that um, provides the cartridge, okay, the color coding is going to remain the same. So black indicates organic vapor filtering cartridge, okay? So this is just a cartridge and really organic vapor cartridges are the ones that you are primarily going to be using uh, when you're applying pesticides and you, um, you know, need to filter out the gases. Those are the most common. Let me see if I remember to do this. Um, so the green is, uh, so the white I believe is acid gas and either the green or the olive is ammonia gas. One's ammonia gas plus organic vapors or something. So each of the colors indicates a different con type of contaminate, co contaminant that it's going to filter out, okay? But black is the most common, so keep that in mind. And so sometimes also around the band, it'll say organic vapor, um, but certainly in the packaging, when you purchase it, it has to say organic vapor, and it will also say NIOSH on it because the cartridges and the respirators and everything have to be tested and certified by NIOSH. So the chemical cartridge respirators can be either a full face, like you see here on the right, or a half face, okay? But even though these cartridges look different, this one right here is round, and this is a bayonet, a bayonet shape, I think that's what they call it. Um, they're, this, they're filtering out the same contaminants, and you know that because the cartridge has a black band around it, okay? Here you can see it says 3M and NIOSH. And the reason why you would choose a full face or a half face depends. Some pesticides, particularly soil fumigants, will specify a full face respirator um, and it does provide an extra layer of protection, but most pesticide labels don't specify a full face respirator, except for just a few. Um, but sometimes it's just more comfortable. So you see how these glasses fit okay. They fit pretty well over the half face respirator, but it's really important that your protective eyewear and your respirator work well together. And so um, if there were any sort of negative interaction, like one interfering with the fit of the other, you might choose to do um, a full face respirator. Okay, so as I mentioned before, there are various NIOSH designations, okay, or TC codes. And TC simply means tested and certified, okay? So if a label, a pesticide label says TC21C, many times they're talking about a powered particulate respirator or powered air purifying respirator. Um, and it's shortened to PAPR for its, um, so, what is it? C less in English, whatever. Whatever that is. It's the, it's the acronym. That's what it is. Okay. So TC21C. Okay. So a TC23C is specifically a chemical cartridge respirator. So it's the one with a cartridge and not just a particulate filter. So a TC84A are these uh, filtering face pieces. The, those are the simplest kind of respirators. But if you had a cartridge respirator that had an N95 filter, um, pre-filter on it, it could also be considered a TC84A. And so these are important to know, but if you don't have them memorized, that's okay. I think you just need to have them on a cheat sheet somewhere, but um, there's going to be context clues on pesticide labels and other requirements that are going to help you identify um, a good, um, the correct respirator. And we'll talk a lot about that. So let's take poll number three. So um, let me describe these photos. So you got to burn them into your brain if you're on a cell phone. Okay, so photo A shows, um, so just to clarify, this like line right here, that's sort of where um, a, a tight fitting respirator would fit. So 
A has some stubble, the guy in B has a pretty substantial beard, and the guy in picture C has um, a nicely trimmed mustache. So which of these individuals is most likely to get a proper seal with a tight fitting respirator? And when I say tight fitting respirator, I mean a filtering face piece or an elastomeric respirator, otherwise known as a chemical cartridge one. So the ones that we've pictured thus far, um, which one of these individuals is most likely to get a proper seal with a tight fitting respirator? All right, I think we're gonna take down this poll and bring up the results. Okay, I could not stump you guys on this. It looks like most people chose C, so the guy with a, uh, a well-trimmed mustache. Okay, so let's see. Oh. So A had some stubble, right? Even 24 hours worth of stubble is going to interfere with the seal of a tight-fitting respirator, okay? so. When you wear a respirator that's tight fitting, you have to be clean shaven. I'm just gonna say that again. If you are wearing a tight fitting respirator, you have to be clean shaven in order to get an adequate seal to protect you, okay? So this guy with a pretty substantial beard, obviously, he's not gonna get a good seal with a tight fitting respirator. And this guy, his mustache is called Chevron. I, I didn't know there were so many fancy names. And I'm just gonna like throw you for a loop. So this is a guy up here on the upper left that is clean shaven. So this line right here indicates where a tight fitting respirator would seal over your face, okay? And so there are just, you can't have any kind of hair, even stubble, growing on that line or growing outside of that line and growing to over it. Like it can't be covering that line, even if it's not rooted in that line. It, that sounds really weird. But um, if you have like, um, for example, this English mustache right here, it's pretty long. So that hair is protruding into where the line is. So it's really important um, to have to be clean shaven in order to get an appropriate seal on a tight fitting respirator. Okay, so I have poll number four. I don't have any photos associated with this one. So can a person with a full beard still safely wear a respirator? And Lisa, while um, people are answering this poll question, I do have a couple of questions for you. Okay. Um, the first one is, what's the difference between pesticide handler and applicator? Do they have to go through the same training? Ah, so I'm going to talk a lot about, um, uh, not a lot, I'm going to talk about training in, in a little bit, but that's a really good question and I wasn't going to address it. Thank you for asking that. So a pesticide handler technically is, so anybody who handles pesticides is somebody who mixes, loads, applies, or cleans application equipment, that's technically a handler. And somebody who's a licensed applicator can handle pesticides. But there's also a term called a pesticide handler, and that's a person who does not have a license to apply. And they work under the supervision of somebody else with the license. And so the respirator training, respiratory protection training requirements apply to employees. So whether that employee has a license or whether that employee is a handler, they still need to receive training um, in order to wear a respirator. Okay, so it really, the, all the regulations are written for employees. So they're, wor they're really worker safety driven, okay? So is there another question? Yeah, there's actually a couple more. So um, what vendor do you recommend to receive training for training handlers, applicators, and general awareness? Um, I don't have any, uh, I don't know if you're talking specifically about respirator training or if you're talking about handler training. Um, 
but I guess I would say it depends. I don't typically recommend vendors, but if you want to shoot me an email, we can maybe talk offline about like what it is you're looking for. He said, um, pest, he just uh, sent something. Pesticide was the Reese. I'm well, assuming. You know, we do pesticide training. We do a pretty good job. So <laughs> you should email me. But if there's something that we don't, some type of training we don't provide, I can, I can give you some names, but I don't know if I would say that I recommend them, but I don't recommend against them either. So I, I'm not as familiar with other people's training programs, all the specifics of it. So. And then just one more, what is the frequency of training requirements for all three categories? So like handler, applicator, I, I think that's what that's referring to. I think so, yeah. I'm going to talk about respirator training later on. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold on answering that question because there's actually a poll question about that. So I don't want to give the answer away. Okay, so I have the poll results. So can a person with a full beard still safely wear a respirator? And the answer is actually yes. So about a third of the people said yes, but I guess... I didn't realize this was a trick question, so I apologize. So you can still safely wear a respirator. You simply cannot wear a tight fitting respirator, okay? So you can wear like the powered air purifying respirators, otherwise known as PAPRs. Um, they have loose foot fitting hoods, okay? And you don't, it's not tight fitting. You don't have to be fit tested. So you do not have to be clean shaven, okay? And that is forced filtered air through a hose. So this is another fill air purifying respirator. And so it works in much the same way as the other two respirators. It's just that, that we talked about, but it doesn't have a tight fit on your face. So it's a really good option if you have employees who um, either have some sort of breathing issue like asthma or like some issue like that, that's gonna make um, using a tight fitting respirator much more difficult for them and maybe not good for their health. Um, but also somebody who doesn't want to be clean shaven. Okay. So you might have employees who are going to refuse to shave. They can wear this. They can wear a powered air purifying respirator and you can fit them with either this HEPA filter, which often is um, a purple, that's a purple band. So it's, it's essentially a P100. So it's like completely oil proof and a hundred percent filter efficiency, which is not if it has P100, it's actually 99.99 or 99.97% filter efficiency. So it's not really 100, but that's the most protective filter that you're going to get. Um, but you can also outfit them with a chemical cartridge respirator, um, chemical cartridge, like an or organic vapor cartridge, and the filter, particulate filter on top. So these ones, these guys can do the same work as those half fitting and full face respirators can do, okay? They're more expensive, but it's easier to breathe and you don't have to be clean shaven. So if you've got somebody who has some issues with wearing tight fitting respirator and is often wearing a respirator, this is a good option. This could be a good option for you. Okay, so let's take poll number five. We're gonna go into more about uh, the respirator requirements. So in California, which of the following statements make respirator use a requirement? So you can choose any of these that you think are applicable. You can choose multiple. So the pesticide label requires me to wear a respirator. B is a county permit condition requires me to wear a respirator. Um, C, a specific regulation requires me to wear a respirator, or D, my employer requires me to wear a respirator. Um, and during this time, Lisa, there is a question that actually probably follows right from this poll, but I'll ask you, um, and then you might want to answer after you get the results from this one. But um, Damien asks, if a label doesn't require a respirator, but for instance, a spray, a tractor spray rig does, must the employee wear a respirator? Um, okay, I'm going to repeat that so I can make sure I understand. So a pesticide label doesn't require the respirator, but a spray rig does. Is that what is said? Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask for a little bit more clarification. I don't, the spray rig being the application equipment, I I'm not fully clear on what the question is, but maybe I'll answer it in the course of answering this poll. 
But okay. if you want to, Damien, if you want to provide more clarification, that, that would be great. Okay, and there is one more here. Um, if we provide only dust masks, uh, not respirators for our employees who choose to wear them, what is the posting that is required? Okay, so if you're wearing a dust mask and not a respirator, and you're trying to filter out dust and you're not filtering out pesticides, then that is not part, like that's just different. That is, um, I actually would have to check on that for you because it doesn't have anything to do with pesticides. So it's more of, you'd have to look at, I think title eight, their OSHA, the OSHA requirements. And so I can, I can answer part of your question a little bit later, but if you're truly talking about a dust mask, because there's dust, um, that's not a pesticide issue. And so these regulations are not gonna apply to that particular dust mask. Um, but if you're talking about a filtering face piece that people are wanting to wear to filter out a, a pesticide applied as a dust, that is a different answer. And I think that I have an answer for you later on in the presentation. So if you could clarify, are you talking really specifically not an N95 dust mist filtering respirator, you're talking just a dust mask, then I, that's an OSHA issue. And I would have to put you in contact with somebody who knows about dust and OSHA, OSHA regulations around dust. Okay, so if the pesticide label requires me to wear a respirator, 99% of you said that you have to wear a respirator and that's 100% correct. That is absolutely correct. And many of you also indicated that these other situations, other scenarios mean that you have to wear, that your respirator use is required and you're absolutely correct, okay? So I'm gonna close this and get into a little bit more explanation. So basically in California, you have to wear a respirator or respirator use is required if it is specified on a label, okay? And it's going to be in the PPE section or precautionary statements, which houses PPE. It's gonna be in the personal protective equipment requirements, okay? So if there is a county permit condition for a particular active ingredient that says, that provides more, re more requirements on top of what the label says, so the label doesn't say anything about respirators, but a permit condition does, then absolutely, that is a required use, okay? And so if there is some regulation that also requires uh, a respirator in a certain situation, then that is a required use, okay? And then if your employer says, you know, this pesticide does not require a respirator, but every time you apply it, you're still gonna wear a respirator, okay? That's employer's policy that you wear a respirator. It's more protective than label requirements, but that is also a required respirator use. So it's really important to know when your respirator use is required and when it is voluntary. If my employer makes me or requires me to wear a respirator above and beyond label requirements, that is a required use. I am not voluntarily using that respirator. So if any of these four things are true, it's a required use and all of the requirements of section 6739, the respiratory protection requirements for pesticides, title three, they all apply, okay? So primarily, you're going to be wearing a respirator either when it's required by the label or when it's your employer's policy. So you're being instructed by your employer, supervisor, whoever, somebody at your workplace is saying, you will wear this respirator when we apply this pesticide. That is a required use. Okay, so we all know this. The label is the law but that is just the half of it, okay? So a label is a federal document and it is the basic, it is the most minimal, it is the minimal that we do um, to use the pesticide correctly. In California, we have additional protections, additional laws, regulations, and one of those is section 6739, 
of Title III. I am not talking about Title VIII. That's completely different. So I'm just talking about pest respirators for pesticide use. So let's take poll six. So if you are required to wear a respirator, how often must you get fit tested or get a fit test? So if, it's, if your respirator use is required, do you have to get a fit test once a year or at least once a year every time the respirator is donned or every time a new pesticide is used? Um, we're getting quite a bit of questions, but I think um, to allow you time to finish, I will probably ask at the end if um, people want to hang around afterwards, but I want to make sure you get through your presentation. Mm -hmm. Okay, he's bringing up the results. So, ah, 84% of you know that if you are required to wear a respirator, you have to get fit tested at least once a year. So if you change respirators um, for whatever reason, if you change the brand or the size or the type, just anything about that respirator changes, you do need to get a fit test again. Um, and if something's changed with the shape and size of your face, like if you've lost a ton of weight or gained a ton of weight, or you've had some surgery that changes the structure of your face somewhat, um, then you'll need to get fit tested for a respirator again. So those are some situations where you might get fit tested for a respirator more than once a year, but it's at least once a year. Oops, gotta close that poll. Okay. So when respirator use is required, you have to get an annual fit test, at least annually. And so before you can even be fit tested, you need to be medically evaluated. So, or you have to have filled out an a medical evaluation form and then send it into it. It gets sent into a doctor, a very specific person, primary healthcare person, and they send back a medical evaluation. So you cannot even get fit tested until you've filled out a medical evaluation and gotten medically cleared, okay? And your respirator must fit properly and seal tightly. So this guy with the beard, this no good. So you have to be clean shaven at your fit test and every single time you wear that respirator, okay? Otherwise, you're not gonna get the adequate fit. And so I'm talking very specifically about the tight-fitting respirators. So as I mentioned before, the powered air purifying respirator that has the loose-fitting hood don't, doesn't require being clean-shaven. Okay, I got another poll for you. So how often should you perform a user seal check? And another name for this is a fit check. So it's not a fit test, it's a fit check. So do you do that at least once a year or do you do that every time the respirator is donned or do you do it every time a new pesticide is used? Okay, we're gonna close this one out and you should see the results screen popping up. Okay. So 82% of you indicated um, that you need to perform a user seal check or what's also known as a fit check every single time the respirator is donned. So what I mean by donned is every single time you put it on, even if you've put it on and taken it off 10 times in the same day, you have to repeat that fit check because even though you know that it fits you because you've gotten your at least annual fit test, you need to make sure it is fitting your face at that time, okay? And that it's put on properly. So a user seal check is called a fit check and you do this every single time you don your respirator and you do a positive and negative pressure check. So I've got a video going here. It's lovely to see my face in two places on the screen. I love it. So I'm donning and adjusting my tight-fitting elastomeric chemical cartridge respirator. And then um, a, a negative fit check is where you cover the cartridges and then you suck in, okay? 
and check to see if there are any leaks. And then a positive fit check is where you close the exhalation valve and then you blow out and it should pop up somewhat, but air should not be escaping. So that is the positive. Oh, that's the negative and that's the positive. Okay, uh, I have another poll for you. So if you are required to wear a respirator, how often must you be trained on respiratory protection? Is it at least once a year, every time the respirator is used, or every time a new pesticide is used, is what I meant to say. Um, so the last one should say every time a new pesticide is used. So this is for employees. So if you're an employee, whether you're a licensed applicator or an unlicensed handler, or whether you're mixing and loading, if you are required to wear a respirator, how often must you be trained? Okay, we're gonna close this one out and bring up the results. So, um, 89% of you, I'm so proud of all of you, um, are required, if you're required to wear a respirator, you must be trained on respiratory protection at least once a year. So if you are a handler or if you're the employer of a handler, they're getting annual handler training on pesticide safety. So this respiratory protection training is in addition to that. It is a separate training, okay? It can, one can build on the other, but it is not the same training, okay? So the respirator training must include why the rest, these are just the general things that have to be included, why the respirator is necessary. So to protect you from whatever pesticide it is, okay? So the limitations and capabilities of the respirator. So if it doesn't seal properly, um, it, if it doesn't fit you properly, or if you're not clean shaven, it's not gonna protect you. You are, um, contaminated air is gonna get in under that seal. Um, so how to use it effectively in an emergency, how to inspect and check the seals, um, what the on-site maintenance and storage procedures are, what are the medical signs and symptoms that may limit or prevent the effective use of respirators? So if you have breathing issues or asthma, that will make it more difficult for you to wear a respirator. Um, and then other general requirements of section 6739 of Title III. So I'm gonna go into sort of how to identify from the labels what respirator you should be using. So I'm not, intending any tacit, subtle, or overt like endorsement of any of these products. They're just ones that I, that I, know, the, I know the labels well enough to know to interpret the, the respirator requirements. So here we have Gramoxone SL 2.0. Um, in the precautionary statement section of that label, there are personal protective equipment or PPE requirements listed. And so this one in particular says, that you must wear a dust mist NIOSH approved respirator with any NRP or HE filter, okay? So it does not give you an approval code. So how, how are you going to know without that TC number, right, from NIOSH? Think about how would you pick out a respirator? So it has to be NIOSH approved. It's very specifically dust mist, so it's, a it is a filtering phase piece. So you have the N, the R, or the P. So there must not be any oil in this formulation because you can wear an N and it's totally fine. It doesn't indicate 95, 99, 100. Many of them don't. So any of those is fine. So in my expert opinion, <laughs> um, this is the appropriate, this is an appropriate respirator for Gramoxone SL 2.0. There are no organic vapors. It doesn't say anything about organic vapors on that label. Okay, so this is the Chateau label. Can you tell I'm a weed scientist? Um, so first of all, I wanna tell you that for the different uses of this pesticide, there are different respirator requirements. They're very similar, but they're two different respirator statements. So read that closely. Um, and so it very specifically says filtering face piece respirator. And it specifically says N95, R95, or P95, okay? So 
there's obviously not oil in this formulation. It's not a heavy oil formulation either. And this again is an accept, this is a compliant respirator, okay? This is a filtering face piece. It is rated at, I think that this one is an R95, but I can't be 100% sure. I'm just trying to look at that picture. Okay, so this is an aquatic herbicide. Um, and so the statement very specifically says dust mist filtering. Are you noticing a pattern here? Dust mist filtering respirator with NIOSH approval number prefix TC21C. So, you know, sometimes the TC codes are wrong and that's why you need to know the context clues. And that's why I told you it's good to know what the TC codes are, but it's not like, it's just a reference, okay? So you have to also take context clues. So back in 1995, um, a new TC code was designed. It's called TC84A. So there, a lot of really old, late, some really old labels will still refer to a filtering face piece as a TC21C. Currently, TC21C means this powered air purifying respirator. And that's actually a perfectly, perfectly acceptable respirator for this purpose, but you could also wear this non-powered air purifying respirator. That TC code should be TC84A. Um, it's just some some of the labels are, are old, but the context clues are zoop, dust mist filtering, okay? So I've got the Roundup label and the PPE statements for Roundup, they don't say a single thing about respirators. <clears throat> so can you wear a respirator with this pesticide? Yes, you can. So if your employer requires you to wear a respirator, it becomes a required use, okay? And so you have to be trained, you have to be fit tested, you have to be medically evaluated, just like as if it were on the label. But if you yourself choose to wear a filtering face piece respirator, Okay, even though it's not required, your employer has the right to say, yep, that's fine, or nope, you can't do that. If you provide your own respirator and or if you're wearing a filtering face piece respirator, there are no other obligations that your employer has other than to post a voluntary respirator uh, posting uh, thing. And, and actually, specifically what you have to post is in the regulation. Um, and actually, anybody who can email me and I'll send you a link to the voluntary respiratory use posting. I am deciding not to go over this. This is uh, overly complicated. So I wanna go straight to poll number 10. So in California, chemical cartridges, so like a black banded OV organic vapor cartridge. Um, so these chemical cartridges usually have to be replaced when? Um, every time a different pesticide is used, after eight hours of use, or at the end of a day of use. Okay, we're going to close this one out. All right. So, oh, it's like neck and neck. So, 42% say after eight hours of use, you have to throw away the chemical cartridges. And 39% say at the end of a day's use. And the technical answer is at the end of a day's use. Okay, so some of you may be familiar with Title VIII respirator regulations and that th those do not apply here. Re pesticides have their own respiratory protection requirements and they're very similar, but there are key areas where they're different and this is one. So even if you're wearing that cartridge for three hours in one day, you have to throw it away at the end of that day's use, okay? You cannot keep it and add up the eight hours. That is, com that is not the intention of that regulation. And so here, let me show you. So technically the regulation says, if you sense any odor or irritation, you throw away the cartridge or the filter, whatever you're wearing and start again, okay? And so that, that's always true. Okay, that means that there's breakthrough, you're not being protected. If you sense odor or like your, soup, your nose or your um, throat super irritated, then something is going wrong with the respirator and you need to reevaluate. 
There are things called end of service life indicators on some respirator cartridge, but I've never seen any for um, pesticides. Um, if you had label instructions, uh, you would follow those. If you have manufacturer's instructions on how long to use the cartridge, then follow those. Barring all of those things, you change out the cartridge at the end of a day's work period, okay? So really what it's gonna be is like, I've never seen an ESLI on a pesticide respirator. I've never seen label instructions that give specific instructions on how long you can use the cartridge. And I've never seen a manufacturer of a cartridge tell you how long you can use it in, in specific terms. So I, so really, if you have odor or irritation, change it, change out the cartridge or the filter. Um, other than that, you change out the cartridge at the end of a day's work period. Okay. And so your filters, so either your filtering face piece or the pre-filters that go over the chemical cartridge, those are the N, R, or P. Um, you dispose of those at different intervals because of the oil in the formulation. So um, N respirator, so the N type, like N95, you dispose of at the end of the day. R, you dispose after eight hours of use or at the end of the day. So, um, so that, so like if you're applying rest, uh, pesticides for and using the respirator for 10 hours, you have to change after eight. Okay, but it's always at the end of the day's use. Um, a P respirator, so P100, P95, whatever, dispose at the end of the day. And an organic vapor cartridge, you also dispose of at the end of the day. So just a reminder that uh, respirators have to be worn correctly to be effective. So this guy not being protected. I mean, the respirator is there, he's fit tested, he's clean shaven, but it's not going to do its job in this situation. Um, I have some additional resources for you. So the safe and effective use of pesticides is our manual for commercial applicators, but it has a really intensive chapter on personal protective equipment, including respirators. Um, we have uh, an online PPE class that you can take for one and a half hours of continuing education, and there is a section on respirators in there. Um, and then here's my contact information of my email address, but also if you want to sign up to get notifications about trainings that we do, whether about respirators or something else, um, you can go to um, the link below. But, um, oh, I'm one minute over. So um, at this point, we will put the link to the final survey so that the participants can put in their email address and their license number so they'll be able to get their certificates of completion. Um, and then after we post all that, if anybody wants to stick around, there are a few other questions if you have time to take those. But we want to make sure um, we stick to the time that we said so that we get all the contact information and links in the chat. And so um, on the screen, there is the link uh, to the survey. And I think Peter's going to put that in the chat as well. And just uh, to note, uh, we have another webinar coming up in January. January 23rd, Dr. Beth Grafton Cardwell will be talking about the Fuller Rose Beetle. And then if you do need additional CE units uh, before the end of the year, we do have many online courses on the UC IPM website and that URL is on the screen as well. Okay, so at this point, I think um, the link is there for the survey, but uh, we can go ahead and do some questions if, if you'd like. Um, some of these, I think, I think Lisa, you might've touched on some of these, but I'll, um, I'll ask them just in case. Um, so Susan asked, what does oil have to do with respirators for pesticide use? Um, so that's a great question. So oil, sometimes there's oil in the formulation or like somewhere in that formulation or sometimes you mix it with oil, but oil is basically going to gunk up the filters and the cartridges. That's why it's important to know that's why it's important to be aware of what the respirator requirements on the label says. So if it says N, R, or P, you know it's not a super oil heavy. So even, a not, even an N filter that's not resistant to oil is going to continue to protect you. But if it requires an R or a P only and it doesn't specify N, 
then you know that there's oil, there's got to be oil somewhere in that formulation, okay? And so the oil in that formulation, so those filters are filtering out dusts, mists, and spray droplets. So if there's oil in the formulation or somewhere in the mix, those spray droplets are oily, okay? And that oil is going to gunk up the filter, and then it's just, it's simply not going to protect you anymore. So really, you just need um, to sort of follow those instructions from the label with regard to the N, the R, or the P, whether you're using a filtering face piece or whether you're using a chemical cartridge and you've got a pre-filter on it. Those are all rated and RRP because of their resistance to oil in the spray droplets. Okay, and then this one's from Lauren. I'm saying, for example, if uh, their technician is spraying Roundup and he chooses to wear a dust mask that they provide, but the label doesn't require it. Um, their understanding is that DPR requires something to be posted if they provide the dust masks, not respirators for employees to use. When does the label not require a respirator? So in the case of uh, um, Roundup, so there's a label, there's no Roundup, I'm, I'm sorry, there's no respirators required on the label. So if you provide them with a respirator, not a dust mask, a dust mask is different than a respirator. So if you're talking about a dust mist filtering respirator, which is you know, a filtering face piece. So it looks like a dust mask, but it's got the two straps. It says NIOSH and it's, you know, N95 or P100, okay? That is a respirator. And so the respirator requirements are, are very specific to respirator use in pesticides, okay? So if it's just a blue dust mask that you get from Home Depot, their DPR doesn't require you to do anything, okay? OSHA maybe, because it is still a workplace hazard to have something covering where you're breathing from, right? So I'm gonna go and assume you mean a dust mist filtering respirator. So whether you provide the employee with those filtering face pieces or whether they do it themselves, if you're not requiring it, it's a voluntary use, okay? And so if it's a voluntary use, and it's a filtering face piece, then you have to post, there's a voluntary respirator use posting. It's like one long paragraph, okay? And I don't have it displayed here, but it's written into the regulation. But if you wanna email me, I, I'm happy to provide you with that, like um, with a link to where you could find that on the DPR website. So yeah, if it's a respirator, that people are wearing when they're mixing, loading, applying pesticides, um, and it's a voluntary use, nobody's requiring it. Um, if it's a filtering face piece, then really your only um, responsibility is to give that, put that posting up. And, and show them the posting, read it to them, and keep it posted. So like, you can't just post it without telling them. You have to sort of ex tell them what it says. Um, Brian had put something in the Q&A, and this might be what you're mentioning. Um, he said they will need a voluntary use display posting one page saying that the employees are voluntarily wearing a respirator because they wanted it, and the posting needs to list the limitations of what a respirator can or cannot do, and he lists, he lists three CCR693R. I don't know yeah. if that's the one. It's, uh, it's three ccr sixty seven thirty nine. R, so yeah. R the subsection. So what Brian said, that's it. Okay. <laughs> and then uh, another question, what if your religion does not allow you to shave and I need to wear a tight fitting respirator? Um, you can't wear, you will not be protected from contaminants in the air if you're wearing a tight fitting respirator and you're not clean shaven where the respirator is, okay? So your options are to either do tasks that do not involve the pesticides that require respirators or use a powered air purifying respirator. So it's not just about requirements. It's like you're just not going to be protected. Con contaminated air, if it's not sealed properly on your face, contaminated air will enter your nose, mouth, and then your lungs. And, and 
and that's all there is to it. So my recommendation to you is to um, either ask to, I mean, like if you can shave in such a way that you can get a tight seal, um, you know, where there's no hair right on that line, then fine. Or if you choose not to shave, that's totally fine. But then you need to use the powered air purifying respirator or ask to only handle pesticides that do not require a respirator. Okay, and then there's a question from Susan. Um, does the powering air filtering respirator require fit testing? A loose fitting powered air purifying respirator does not require a fit test. Great question. Cause it's like, you, you're not gonna get a tight seal, but it's, it's power, but it, it's still protective. <laughs> It's just, it, it, it's only the tight fitting respirators that require that seal. And so, um, and that require uh, a fit test, but yeah, with the PAPR, you do not have to get a fit test. Okay. And then um, there's one, do you have to train agricultural employees who don't handle or apply pesticides? Well, okay. I'm trying to, can you repeat that? Do you have to train agricultural employees who don't handle or apply pesticides? Um, if they don't handle or apply pesticides, you do not have to provide them with handler training. And if they're not handling pesticides, I'm assuming they're also not wearing respirators. So then you wouldn't have to provide them with respirator training. But if they are field workers, so if they're entering a field where there's been an REI in effect in the last 30 days, then you do have to train them on uh, as a field worker. So it's a, it's a different training. Um, and if you wanted to look up the regulation, it's uh, Title III 6764, um, or I can send you a link if you wanna send me an email. Okay, and then there's one from Linda. Can you differentiate a bit on the different respirators that a medical evaluation is required? Um, for example, a filtering face piece versus others. Okay, thank you for that question. I don't think I made that clear. So anytime you have a respirator that is required, you have to get a medical evaluation, whether it's tight fitting or loose fitting, okay? So the filtering face pieces, which are the TC84A, um, the chemical cartridge, um, TC23C with the actual cartridge, whether it's half face, full face, um, those are all three um, tight fitting, okay? So even the powered air purifying respirator, if it's a required use, you still have to be medically evaluated. Oh, actually, I, I'm gonna have to follow up with you. If it's tight fitting, 100%, you have to be medically evaluated even before you get a fit test. But I, I feel like I need to clarify I need to look at the regs to double check if you have to get medically evaluated for like a PAPR. I think that the answer is yes, but I'm going to have to get back to you. So um, if you leave your email address or send me an email with that question, um, I will have to, I have an industrial hygienist who works in the office down the hall. Okay, I have a question for you, Lisa, um, from Brian. Is it true that wearing a respirator can be harmful? I have heard that the N95 dust mask can be harmful just from wearing it. Um, so respirators can be harmful in a certain way. First of all, if you're not wearing them correctly, they're, they themselves are not harmful other than they give you this, if you're wearing them incorrectly or if you don't have the right seal or if you've not been fit tested or if you haven't done your fit check, so they're not sealing properly, you've got this false sense of security. Like you think you can do anything, you've got this respirator that's protecting you when in reality it's not protecting you. So if you've been medically cleared to wear that particular respirator, um, you've been fit tested, you've done your fit check and you've maintained it and uh, changed all the cartridges and filters at the end of each day's use and it fits you properly and you're wearing it correctly, it will, it will protect you from contamin you know, the contaminated air. But it is, I don't want to say it's harmful to wear a respirator, but if you have some um, breathing issues, like some people that have asthma, just sort of depends on the severity. If you have any other lung incapacitation, 
then a res wearing a respirator can absolutely be harmful to you because you've got this thick paper filter blocking your access to air. Okay. And that's kind of a big deal. And so you have to have strong enough lung capacity to propel that air over that thick filter. So that's where the medical evaluation comes in. So if people are honest on their medical evaluation, um, then they need to honestly answer those questions. Okay. And so that um, a medical professional can provide you with an adequate medical clearance. And so the medical clearance could come back. Yeah, you're fine. Or you should really only be using powered air purifying respirators because those are e it's easier to breathe with those. Um, so I, I don't want the respirator itself is not harmful per se, but there might be some limitations within your own body, like people who have been smoking heavily for 20 years. It is not typically a good idea to wear a respirator, but, but that's not to say that you should uh, handle those pesticides without wearing a respirator, right? You should just not be wearing, doing that task or you should be wearing a different respirator. So we, that's where the medical evaluation comes in. And some people have told me that you know, the medical evaluation is just a, uh, a paper questionnaire, right? And you send it into the doctor and they medically clear you. They can medically clear you without seeing you. So some people have told me that they, um, that they send their people in to physically see the doctor. You know, if there's any kind of question or concern, that's definitely a more protective way to go about it. Okay, there's uh, one question in chat. It says, where do you get a fit tested conducted? Can any doctor perform the assessment? And do the results have to be, I think results have to be submitted anywhere and what should be asked of the physician? Okay, can we take that one at a time? Yeah, <laughs> where do you go to get a fit test conducted? So there are various organizations that will provide fit tests. I, I know of a couple, I'm gonna say them, but I, I'm it's like, I know that there are more, you know, so if you're here in Northern California, MVP up in Woodland, I know for sure that they do fit tests. I know that Univar does fit tests as well, but you know, a lot of people provide that service. And so it's like probably target specialty products too. I mean, there are in um, Cal Ag Safety, I believe they do too. I don't have a comprehensive list. And in fact, I don't, I don't think a comprehensive list exists, but that's a, that's a great idea for a resource. So list of fit test providers. Okay. Because you self train to do a fit test. Okay. So if you're doing a qualitative fit test, like the smoke test, the Bitrix, the banana oil, that is self-taught. Okay. So as long as you're following procedure and you're doing it properly you, and almost anybody can do that. You can train yourself to do it, but there are a lot of organizations that actually do it. But if they're trying to do a quantitative fit test on you with the port account, like this big technical crazy machine, they have to be specifically trained on that. So I, I, I mean, you don't have to be a certified idental, uh, industrial hygienist, but you could be. So um, yeah, I would be, yeah. Somebody who's doing the quantitative fit test has to be a lot more trained. Okay, what's the second question in that string? So it was, can any doctor perform the assessment? The medical evaluation? No, and that's a, um, there are many doctors who can, and there is a list of provide, no. Um, I don't, I know there's a list of providers for the medical evaluation. I'm trying to remember if, but it's OEHA, Office of Environmental Health and Hazard Assessment, has a list of providers, um, at least that do medical supervision for like organophosphates. And I would, I would imagine that those are similar, per, some of the same providers that do, um, that, that do the medical evaluation. But you would have to ask a provider, do you do medical evaluations for respirator fit testing? Okay, but um, if you, I can, you can look it up on the OEHA website or I can look it up and send it to you. Um, okay. Okay, and then it was asking about uh, where the results would be submitted. Um, so I, I believe that those are just, that's just part of your written respiratory protection program. You don't have to submit anything, but the county, if they see, you know, the county inspectors, if they see you, you, you um, 
with employees using respirators, they, they are very likely to come and do an inspection, you know, ask questions of the respirator user and they have the right to, you know, ask for your records and stuff. So it's all forms part of your written respiratory protection program. You know, all of that paperwork, the documentation of the training and the documentation of the fit testing and the medical evaluation. Um, and so, you know, DPR does provide a template for a respiratory protection, uh, written respiratory protection program. Um, I don't have a direct link for you, but I mean, if you went to cdpr.ca.gov and searched for respiratory, uh, respiratory protection, I'm sure that you could come up with that. I mean, I could also send out a, a, a list of links too. Okay, and minute. the final part of that one was what should be asked of the physician. I think you would just need to confirm with them that they are qualified to provide that medical evaluation for a pesticide use respirator fit test. And they, I mean, they, they would know if they're qualified to do that or not. It's not like, you know, they don't have to do a residency in order to do that. It, it's usually primary um, healthcare physicians. And, and certainly like if you're in an ag area and it's like a, a medical clinic where you send people for first aid for pesticide poisoning, I mean, certainly somebody on staff there is very likely to be able to provide medical evaluation. And in fact, there are some that are like not even located in California. I mean, there, there are many people, there are many medical pro providers who can do the medical evaluation. Okay, I think there's just a couple more final questions for you, Lisa. Uh, one was, why do we have to be medically evaluated? Um, because, um, well, it goes back to making sure your body is capable of forcing all that air across a big heavy filter. You know, there's those thick paper filters, the chemical cartridges, it's, it's, if, it's just different than breathing ambient air just without any kind of impediments. So if you have any, you know, if you're a heavy smoker, if you have um, any kind of lung capacity issues or asthma, those are all things that might preclude you from safely using a respirator. I mean, you're trying to get uh, purified air into your lungs but if you're having trouble getting any air at all because of the purification system, then that's, that's not good for you, you know, and you're probably wearing PPE. It's going to be hot, you know, because it gets hot here and PPE makes you even hotter because it doesn't breathe. And so those are all conditions that you really have to be uh, in um, good enough physical condition to really withstand all of that. I mean, you don't have to be like an Iron Man or something like that, but or iron woman either. Okay, there's one in the chat that says, do mechanics who fix sprayers have to be tested? Um, if they are, if they're wearing a respirator, that's kind of a conundrum because they're not mixing, loading or applying. So if they're um, like fixing equipment or cleaning equipment that has just had an application done and that pesticide, any of those pesticides that were applied in that tank require a respirator, then yeah, because that person has got their face right in front of the nozzle where a pesticide, you know, and if they're cleaning it out, there's still pesticides in there, there could still be organic vapor. So I, I would say only if they're, you know, um, cleaning or maintaining a sprayer that has um, j just sprayed those pesticides, that require a respirator. So if that person is for whatever reason required to wear a respirator, then absolutely they have to be fit tested for that respirator as well. Okay, here's a last question. Um, does the owner or operator need to use a respirator if the label indicates it? Yes, so the, so everybody has to follow the requirements of the label, everybody. Okay, and so all of these additional requirements for fit testing and all that stuff, or for medical evaluation, those are, a lot of those additional requirements are very specific to employees. Um, but yes, if a, if a pesticide requirement 
requires a respirator on the label, even if you're the owner operator, you have to wear that. Just like you have to wear that, P you know, whatever other PPE is listed. So yes, everybody has to wear a respirator when it's on the label. Okay, I think I have one follow-up question. Um, this was from Lauren who had asked about posting earlier. Uh, so as long as we don't provide them with a respirator, but only a one strap dust filter, then no posting is required for DPR? So no posting would be required for 6739. And I can't think of any other DPR regulation where it would be required, but you really do need to check in with OSHA because like if there's a dust hazard, you might have to assess, you know, like um, the particulates in the air to make sure that dust mask is um, adequately protecting them from the dust. I mean, if it's really that dusty, then there, that might be still another workplace safety hazard issue. Um, but if it's a dust mask and they're using it for dust and they're not trying to use it for respirators, um, then there's no posting required for that particular use in 6739. Okay, so I think at this point we're going to um, turn off the webinar and I want to thank everybody for coming. And Lisa, thank you for your time and for pre presenting this webinar on respirators. I think it was very helpful. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And um, we hope you'll come back to our next webinar in January.